Up next, we have Armand Dadgar, who's another co-founder, and he'll talk about modern secrets management with Vault. Welcome, Armand. Hey everybody, thank you guys for uh, making it out here. We're super excited, as Mitchell said, to, to kick off sort of the first of hopefully uh, many Hashi days. So, you know, let us know what you like, what you don't like. We're sort of experimenting with uh, the setup and the style and sort of what, the, what we want the, the track layout to be. So let us know what you think. Uh, so with that, I want to sort of jump right into Vault. Uh, we've got a lot to cover today. You know, as Mitchell sort of laid out, we really think about it in, in sort of these multiple layers. So I'm just going to home in and just talk about sort of the security layer and kind of like what we're trying to tackle with Vault uh, more broadly. So what I want to talk about briefly is sort of starting at very high levels. You know, what are the sort of broad categorical use cases that we sort of think about when we, when we talk about Vault? And then go into sort of a deeper intro, particularly looking at, you know, what are the security principles behind the product? I think oftentimes we talk about sort of the features, but not necessarily uh, give a lot of clarity as to like what were the principles that kind of led us to implementing the system in that particular way. And, and then I'm going to end by just start talking about some of the new stuff, because um, as Mitchell said, there's kind of a torrent of new functionality all the time. So sort of the highest level when we think about Vault, there's kind of three broad categories it falls into. One is what we call secrets management. And this is largely in the realm of sort of in an automated application-driven way, how are applications getting access to database credentials, API tokens, TLS certificates, things that they need to function, but material that is generally sensitive. Then we have encryption as a service, which is in some sense almost a subset of that problem, which is really just looking at cryptographic material. So encryption keys, public-private keys, things like that. How do we actually manage the life cycle of key material, as well as do cryptographic offload? So if we don't want our developers implementing encryption in their app, how can they offload both the key management and the cryptography to Vault? And then the last one has to do more with human operators. How do we get access to the credentials we need to do database maintenance or inspect something in the AWS console uh, when that information should be privileged and protected? So highly related to sort of the first problem, but more of a manual access path as opposed to a programmatic. So with that, just before we jump into kind of the domain of Vault and its features, you know, what is secret management? What are we actually talking about when we talk about secret management? A secret really is anything that can be used for authentication, username, password, uh, API tokens, or authorization. So maybe you know, doing mutual TLS to authenticate and authorize access to a system. These are pieces of information that sort of grant you access or elevate your permission in a system. And then sensitive information is highly related to that, uh, but, it, but it's different. It doesn't necessarily grant you access to anything. It's just information that you want kept confidential. Right? And it's worth making a distinction because the order of magnitude of the two is very different. Right? You might have thousands or tens of thousands of pieces of secret information, but you may have billions uh, of pieces of confidential information. And so the questions we like to ask when we're in sort of the secret management mindset has to do with access. Right? It's all. It's all about how do applications get access, how do humans get access, how do we update the secrets people have access to, how do we audit who had access to things, uh, when we revoke things, how does that get enforced, and what do we do in the event of a compromise? So really almost everything revolves around sort of the question of understanding, managing access. And sort of the state of the world, what we tend to see everywhere, is what we refer to as secret sprawl. Right? This is a state in which Secret material is sort of distributed all over the place. It's in Dropbox, it's in GitHub, it's in Chef and Puppet. Um, there's typically sort of a decentralized management scheme to it, um, very ad hoc, limited visibility, limited control, uh, and very little sort of break glass procedure. So if something goes wrong and we need to revoke, what do we actually do? It tends to be poorly, poorly defined. So with that sort of intro then to Vault in terms of how do we start to look at all of these problems and tackle them? Right? And so the goal, the sort of you know, most functional goal for it is how can we become a single source of truth for all the secrets in an organization? Right? And so this is both programmatic, so applications that need access to it, automation, config management, uh, as well as manual, so the sort of more privileged access management category. And the goal is to do this in a practical way. Right? Security tends to be sort of like water, right? like it takes the path of least resistance. Uh, so if you make the system too difficult, too challenging, but you know, theoretically perfect, uh, nobody will use it. So finding that right middle ground where it's going to be usable, it's going to fit into modern data centers and not require specialized hardware. 
And so with that, you end up with a set of sort of high-level features, right, that drive this goal. One is just at the most basic level, how can we be a secure bit storage facility, right? It's a secure place to just put things. Then as we get into sort of more fancy capabilities, you get into things like dynamic secret generation. And we'll talk about that in terms of like how do you get to one-time credentials and unique identification. Uh, part of this, you end up with you know, more complex mechanisms around leasing and renewal. And then there's sort of security bread and butter, things like auditing, rich access control systems, multiple authentication mechanisms. And so what I want to ground this in as we go through these features is a number of security principles. I think this is what we don't often talk about is why does Vault do these things? Why does it force us necessarily to think about things like leases? And it's really to drive in a number of these very core security principles. Right? The most basic one is really confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Right? It's sort of, you know, it, it was coined by the CIA and it's sort of a fun uh, three-letter acronym. Uh, and really looking at how do we keep our confidential material confidential, right, from eavesdroppers, from people who shouldn't have access, um, from outside parties. How do we ensure the integrity of it so it's not tampered with, it's not changed without us realizing? And how do we make sure these systems are available, right? Because they may be under attack by people who don't have access but can sort of force the system into being unavailable. Then there's sort of more general principles, things like least privilege. How do we keep information to a sort of a need-to-know basis, right? This is one of the, you know, the best way to prevent you know, leaks is not to, not to give people access in the first place. Then you get into separation of controls. So even if people actually need access, how can you segment that access? So maybe some very sensitive operations need multiple people to be involved so that if you have one bad actor within an organization, it's not enough for them to sort of compromise the integrity of the system. There's privilege bracketing. So how do we time limit access? So even though you may need access, do you need access 24 hours a day, 365 days a week? Uh, or is it enough to sort of have access for an hour at a time so that you know, maybe you, you get a piece of malware and you know, your, your laptop isn't permanently authenticated to do an operation? Then you have things like non-repudiation. This is really where auditing comes from is you know, how do we get into the you know, I didn't do that type scenario, right? Like we want sort of a, this audit log that proves undeniably that someone has done something, right? And then defense in depth. You have to assume all of these systems will be compromised. You have to assume there's bugs in the implementation. You have to assume the workflows are insecure and people have malware. And so how do you build defense in depth and really have multiple independent overlapping security mechanisms? So the first sort of future, feature sorry, um, is sort of just being a secure bit dump. If we just want to put something securely somewhere so that it's not in plain text, it's not sitting in GitHub, uh, that's sort of one of the core vault functions. And the promise there is data should always be encrypted, both in transit and at rest. Uh, and so what vault tries to do is pick sort of the most secure, most conservative default so you really don't have to think about it. It sort of should just do the right thing for you. And so this means everything at rest is AES-256. Uh, everything on the wire going to and from vault is TLS 1.2. And it does all of this in pure software. So there's really no hardware security module requirement. It's just commodity, you know, cloud VMs work fine. And this is sort of looking at how do we provide confidentiality and integrity, right? Like going back to those principles, how do we sort of look at those two and say, you need this, and it's really about that end-to-end -end encryption. This is done in a way that's sort of transparent to the users themselves. So when you're interacting with Vault, here's sort of just a CLI example of maybe we're writing you know, secret foo to it, and then we're reading that thing back. We don't really think about this, right? Like on the wire between the Vault client and the Vault server, it's encrypted. When Vault's putting the secret at rest, it's encrypted but it's invisible to us. It's sort of doing the right thing without us really having to think about it. This goes back to sort of making it practical, making it you know, so that you don't resist it. Then as we start getting fancier, you get into this world of sort of leasing of renewal and revocation. So one promise Vault makes is that every dynamic secret, and we'll talk about what that means, has a lease associated with it. And the contract of the lease is the secret you get from Vault is valid up until the expiration of that lease, right? But the, the secret, if, it, if that lease isn't renewed, can be revoked by Vault, right? And this lease can also be used to revoke things early by an operator so that we can start defining things like break glass procedures, right? So in case you know, our MySQL is compromised, maybe we don't wait until the end of that lease to revoke it. And so the idea behind a dynamic secret is really how do we get away from providing a root credential to anyone, right? Like we don't really want 500 web servers all using MySQL root root, right? Because then if there's actually a compromise, how do you key roll it? You have 500 clients using it. If it's leaked, it's very hard to investigate where the origin point is. There's too many sort of shared credentials. It's sort of be like every single person in the company logging in with one LDAP credential. 
And so what we'd like to do instead is generate these credentials on demand such that they're unique per client, right? And the leases are what give us an enforceability mechanism to this, and the audit trails help us pinpoint that point of compromise. So instead of every single person logging in with one user effectively, everyone's logging in with a unique user, you can correlate this user had this login, and it helps us sort of have a dramatically improved security story. What it looks like under the hood is a user will make a request to Vault uh, requesting credentials. This could be a human operator. This could be an application doing it in a programmatic way. And then Vault will go back and talk to the database and create a dynamic credential. So we'll go talk to MySQL and generate a new dynamic username and password. This will end up in our audit trail. And then the user will get these dynamic credentials back. And so the idea from this is by making this pluggable, over time we're going to support sort of any type of backend system that your app really needs to talk to. Today it already supports sort of a huge list of RDBMSs, NoSQL systems, uh, cloud APIs, so maybe you're generating AWS IAM tokens on demand. And the idea here is that these plugins are kind of split from the core functionality. So, and this goes back to that sort of defense in depth design of Vault, right? The backends are not responsible for authentication, authorization, auditing, the rest of the sort of core function of the system is split from this integration. Sort of thinking about the design of the system as well as a defense in depth. And so the why have leasing? Like what's the point of that extra complexity? It goes back to all of those sort of security principles that we're trying to get to. Like, yes, it enables this sort of uh, enforceable lease, but it goes back to things like privilege bracketing. How do we prevent your MySQL you know, credential from being valid forever, right? Because once you have sort of an assumption that this credential is valid till the end of time, you're, it's very hard to do things like key updates. It's very hard to do um, you know, revocation because your assumption is now that things last forever. So going back to how do we bracket privilege, how do we have non-repudiation, so every 24 hours your app is renewing that lease and we can say, yes, Web Server 42 has been talking to that database with this credential that whole time. The update cycle is bounded, so if I change my MySQL password, I can bound and say within 24 hours or three hours, depending on my configuration, all my clients will move over to the new uh, configuration and enables revocation because now I'm actively managing and tracking who is using what everywhere in the cluster. And so it adds this layer of complexity that we have to think about, but it brings with it a bunch of these, uh, these sort of enhanced features. Then sort of the bread and butter of security is sort of the three A's, authentication, authorization, and auditing. Uh, from an authentication perspective, there's really two ways we think about it. One is machines that are authenticating, and one is humans. Uh, they have very different, uh, different requirements. And so there's different backends that are designed to support these different, different interactions. Uh, and then on the ACL side, it's a very rich, authorization language. I'll talk about some of the new features there that let us get very, very fine-grained. But it's built around the sort of least privilege default deny model. So everything is sort of on an as-need-to-know basis. And lastly, you can do full, rich request response auditing around everything. And the system designed in a fail-closed way. So if you set up audit logging and all of your audit logging backends are unavailable and you can set up you know, as many as you'd like for availability reasons, the system fails closed. And this goes back to sort of that non-repudiation, right? Is if I'm a bad operator and I know, hey, Vault is gonna, know, is gonna log that I'm doing these bad things, why don't I just knock out Splunk for a little while, do what I wanna do, and then turn it back on, then you know, that's a bad design of the system. The system allows you to get into this mode where I can deny having ever done something, right? Versus when the system fails in a closed way, now you get this non-repudiation. I can't perform an operation that wasn't audited. There's a high availability has been built into the system since 0, 01, uh, and it takes the sort of active standby model. So you can use console. It's, I think it's now been extended, so you can use a bunch of things, etcd, zookeeper, other backends, uh, and do leader elections. So you can run many instances of Vault. And if the, the primary fails, it falls over to one of the secondaries. And so this gives you a, a good availability story, kind of going back to that CIA trio. And then multi data center replication, which landed in the latest you know, enterprise version, gives you a primary secondary, so you can actually span multiple geos as well. One of the sort of core challenges behind Vault is sort of the, the turtle tower of security, um, which is, you know, if data is encrypted at rest itself, how does Vault, when it starts, decrypt its own data, right? Like, how does it get its own key? And so it requires this decryption key fundamentally. And the choice we've taken with Vault is to provide this key online, right? What we often see is if you allow that key to be provided by configuration, then it will end up being provided by configuration, which itself is managed by configuration management. And before you know it, you know, your root encryption key actually just lives in GitHub and sort of defeats the entire system. 
And so by making it just hard enough and providing it online, it prevents this sort of like putting it into Puppet. And so you have this master key that encrypts everything else, and this thing ends up being the sort of key to the kingdom in some sense, right? It's encrypting all of the data sort of transitively. And so how do we protect that piece of information, right? How do we protect against the insider threat, which is the people who have that key might use it in a malicious way? And the sort of standard practice is what's called privilege separation or two-man rules, is you have to have multiple people involved uh, to, do, to do an operation. And so what this looks like, the algorithm the vault employs, is called Shamir secret sharing. And what we do is we have sort of the encryption keys, which protect all the data at rest. We never expose that to, to any operator. Instead, we have a master key that wraps and protects the encryption keys. That master key itself is also not shared. We split that out into n different shares. Those are what we actually provide out to the operators. And you have to recombine some number of them, some threshold, uh, to rebuild that master key. So by default, the system builds five different, master, five different shares, three of which must be re recombined to form that master key. And so now there's really no access granted to an operator who's a key holder, right? Like having one of these five keys really doesn't give you anything. There's no information that's leaked about the master key. There's no capability to do anything against the system. And this goes back to that principle of privilege separation, right? Is that now you need a quorum of operators to really perform a very sensitive operation, uh, which can result in the compromise of the master key. And so sort of a summary of the design principles is really looking at how do we solve that secret sprawl problem of material living everywhere, very low visibility, very low management of these things, and sort of pull that into a center where we have strong visibility, strong control over the authentication, authorization, and auditing of everything. And really looking at two different classes of threats. Uh, one is insider threat, which is people who have some access to the system abusing that access. And that's really built around things like the ACL system, secret sharing, looking at things like principles of least privilege, a privilege separation, bracketing. And then looking at external threats, and that's really about the crypto system, is how do you provide confidentiality, integrity, and protect the system against people who are on the outside. And it's really about applying these best practices sort of in a seamless way. So you don't really don't have to think about it. It's kind of that water flowing analogy. It's like it's just taking the right path, the sort of secure path. So now I want to touch a little bit on some of the other features. Uh, encryption is a service, sort of a special case uh, in of some of the secret management stuff. And the reason for that is sensitive data needs to be protected. We have all sorts of sensitive data, email, social security, credit card information, addresses, the sort of list goes on and on. You maybe just have logs of user activity that's sensitive. And there's just an explosion of this kind of data. And the problem is cryptography is hard. Um, it's really hard to get it right. Uh, storing keys securely is very, very difficult. Uh, just storing them at all is hard. And then you talk about key life cycles in terms of OK, how do we renew it, or how do we rotate it every 30 days? How do we decommission old keys? How do we re-encrypt data uh, under new keys to make sure that you know, uh, encrypted data stays accessible as we move keys out of commission? And it becomes incredibly challenging. Right? Most apps fail to implement the cryptography correctly, let alone any of the key management. And so what we've tried to do with Vault is take a look at this problem and say, how do we make this really easy? How do we provide a high-level REST API to sort of make it obvious how to do the right thing? And what this has resulted in is what we call the transit backend. And the idea is this is data that Vault is only seeing in transit. Right? It's not actually storing the data. And the, result of, and the reason for that is it goes back to sort of the orders of magnitude we're talking about. Right? With secret data, yeah, Vault can store all of it. Maybe you have 100,000 keys total. But with sensitive data, Vault's not designed to store hundreds of millions, billions uh, of pieces of data. And so instead, it sort of can inspect this data in transit as it flows through the Vault system. And so it provides these high-level APIs to do encryption, decryption, HMACing, signing, rewrapping, re-encrypting, that kind of stuff. And what's nice about this approach is the applications never have access to the underlying keys. So you don't have to worry, did my app accidentally expose that key? Did it log it out? Did it not do the encryption in the correct way? It lets us decouple the sort of key management and encryption concern from the actual storage concern. So great, we know how to do our scale out with our sharded database, or we're using NoSQL, or whatever we're doing to manage the storage volume. It decouples that from the encryption challenge. Right? It lets Vault deal with one, and existing databases deal with the other. And in this way, we can sort of outsource the entire secret management problem to Vault. And so what this kind of looks like in practice is you might have an app, let's say a web server, it's getting hit with a request with sensitive user data, like please store this, you know, it's my credit card, whatever. And the application just makes use of an API against Vault, so sends that over, says please 
please encrypt this uh, plain text for me and return the cipher text. We now have an audit trail of this, so we can see which app is actually leveraging encryption keys and what they're doing, right? So maybe you have a customer support person that for whatever reason is decrypting all of the data in your system. That shows up in an audit log, and you have visibility into sort of who's making use of those keys. And then once we have this encrypted cipher text, we just store that in our database, and we use sort of the existing scale-out techniques we know. We can cache it. We can put it in. You can shard it. Do whatever we need to. And then sort of the reverse of it is sort of flowing in the exact opposite. It's pull out the cipher text from the database, flow it back through Vault to decrypt, and then present it back to the user. So sort of uh, a reversible thing. And so some of the use cases when we sort of talk about this is things like HMACing for user password. Right? It's almost like every week you see like, Company X in the news for like not bothering to hash an HMAC or not salting things properly, and so it's sort of like just outsource it to a system that no, you know is going to do this correctly. Uh, encryption for sensitive data is a very obvious use case for transit. Uh, we have things like convergent encryption, so if you need to search over encrypted data, maybe you just want to know like, hey, does this credit card is it already registered to some other account in my system? But I don't want to store the credit cards in plain text, but I want to be able to search over them. So there's mechanisms for being able to do that in a secure way. Uh, doing signing for service to service requests. So as you move to sort of a microservice architecture and these different things are sort of interacting with each other, how do you ensure that, you know, as a service is performing an operation that it sort of starts from an authenticated user that should be doing that, right? That we're not just saying because we're on a private network, any API request is trusted, right? Like, and moving to more of a zero trust model. And then things like signing a very large, encrypting a very large objects, right? Like Vault is really not designed for you to stream, you know, a 50 gigabyte file through it, but it provides some of the right underlying facilities to generate and manage the encryption keys and then move some of that crypto out of the app uh, for when you have very large objects. And so now I just want to touch a little bit on some of the new features that have landed in Vault. Vault uh, has sort of an incredible feature velocity, so it's, it's hard, to, hard to keep track. Um, and Mitchell touched on some of them. One of the, one of the biggest ones uh, for us that we're pretty proud of is the replication work that landed in 07. And it, as Mitchell said, it's a primary secondary model. So you know, trying to avoid the what happens if you have multiple masters and conflicting rights type of thing is sort of prevent that from happening at all by taking a, a primary secondary approach. And so the primary is the source of truth, and it's pushing down and replicating to sort of replicated secondaries. And the goal here is really twofold. One is a multi-data center availability story. So how can my data center lose connection to all of its other data centers but stay functional? And request scaling as well. So maybe I'm within a data center and I just need more throughput for things like encryption as a service. And so the replication design was really looking at a few things, right? Starting from those high level features, one of the top goals was sort of an asynchrony of operation. And the reason for this is availability was a top priority, right? As, as we're talking about multi data center type of uh, challenges, you really don't want to lose your WAN link and say, you know, all of my data centers off, uh, you know, across the world are now offline because they don't have synchronous access to the primary. So this was a super key goal. Uh, and we wanted this to be transparent to clients. So as clients that are already talking to Vault servers move to the new replicated model, it should be invisible to them that the cluster is replicated. So the goal here is, is to make this possible by doing things like write forwarding. So when a client is doing a write to a secondary, that's being transparently forwarded to the primary. Uh, and then we're sort of stalling the client until replication catches up. So a client can sort of do a write immediately followed by a read and not notice any sort of consistency issues uh, that result from the sort of asynchronous model the system's using, it's sort of hiding that from the user to the best of our ability. And then reads are just being serviced locally where possible so that you're not incurring that sort of backhaul back to the primary. And so the implementation of this, as we're sort of getting into more of the nuts and bolts of it, it looks very similar to sort of a database, if, you, if you're sort of familiar with, with database replication models, is at the core of it is uh, a write-ahead log, which basically is, is sort of a sequential set of operations that have modified the primary. So anytime a write takes place against the system, we write out uh, a log ahead of doing anything. So you say, hey, someone's about to write secret key foo uh, with value of bar equals vacant. We put that in, a, in sort of a log. Once the log is safely written, then we can update the state of Vault itself and say, great, actually write the key secret foo out now. And then we can just ship these wall records to all of our secondaries. So the secondaries that are sort of catch keeping up with us, we just ship the walls down to them. They apply it. And as long as everyone's applying the same series of transactions in the same order, uh, we should end up in the same state. And so primarily depends on this log shipping, uh, which makes it relatively fast, right? As our secondaries are caught up, they're just getting these very small deltas and applying the same operation the primary is, and they're in very close sync. So 
Most of the time, it's sort of like the whatever the round trip time is on the wire between the, your, your data centers is what you're getting as your replication lag. Now, with any wall-based system, and many of us have felt this pain, uh, is you can run into sort of the end of the walls, right? So what happens if you fall too far behind, right? You're, you know, you maintain the last, whatever, 20,000 operations, and you happen to be at, you know, oh shoot, 20,001 records behind uh, the primary, what now? And so oftentimes, you know, many databases sort of throw you, uh, throw you into the water on this one in terms of, you know, you find some way to do a full disk snapshot uh, and ship this, you know, giant 500 gig thing over and like, Hopefully, no transactions are taking place at the same time. Uh, and so Vault sort of looks at this head on and says, like, this is an operator mode that we really, really don't want to deal with. We really don't want operators to have to deal with figuring out how to do an atomic disk snapshot and replicate that in a secure way. And so we make this Vault's concern. So in addition to the log shipping mechanisms that, that keep the system sort of fresh when it's in a happy path, uh, we use this hash-based index indexing method as well. So any key, any sort of piece of information that's under Vault's management gets sort of a secondary index. And it uses this, this technique called Merkle trees or hash indexes. You can think about it almost like sort of, a, sort of a balanced binary tree where every node is sort of a hash of the children nodes, right? So as long as your two root hashes are the same, you know both trees are, are the same with very, very high confidence, uh, especially if you're using sort of cryptographic quality hashes. And when you're wrong, when the two hashes are wrong, you can sort of walk the tree to figure out which branches, which children have diverged, and sync only subsets of the tree. So if you have you know, two million keys under management, you don't really want to re-replicate all two million keys just because five of them are wrong, right? You'd really just rep rather replicate those five. Uh, and then sort of bringing this all together and saying, okay, well, the system has many different moving pieces, right? There's a wall mechanism, there's the actual objects at rest, there's a hash. All of these things are taking place asynchronously. How do we do this in a safe way? And really looking to databases and how they solve this, which is you know, a, a relatively well-known algorithm called ARIES, uh, which is the automated recovery uh, and integrity algorithm basically databases use. So if you're you know, using Postgres and you say you know, start transaction, you write some stuff and you know, power loss hits the database, when it comes online, it applies the ARIES algorithm to recover the state of the system and roll back your transaction. And so Vault uses the same algorithm, basically. So if you have power loss in the middle of a transaction, you know, you're going to get this sort of index corruption uh, and, and transactions that are sort of missing and partially applied. And the system is designed to sort of deal with this for you. So the goal really was looking at this and saying, how do we make this zero touch for operators, right? Particularly given that it's such a security sensitive operation, right? Like you don't want to say like, oh, something has gone wrong here, operator, you have sort of unlimited access to the system now and like please don't steal its data and do the replication correctly. And instead make that sort of vaults challenge to do it, do it properly. I guess I probably should have used these for, for some illustrative use. Um, but this is sort of like the happy path is like things are good. The vault clusters are sort of very closely synchronized. We're just log shipping and this is the asynchronous replication mode. Uh, and then when things go sour, when things go south, they move into that active index-based reconcile. So this is where they're going to use that hash-based index to say, great, we have two million keys on their management. Which five are causing us the problem here? Uh, and once they've reconciled their index, they can switch back into the fast log streaming mode. And then all of this is sort of hidden from us in, in the UI. So we can just come in here and say, like, great, the system is in stream wall mode. Things are happy. We really don't have to think about it. If things are sad, it will sort of light it up with some warnings and be like, we're reconciling. Please wait. Um, but usually the reconcile is relatively brief. So that's, that's sort of replication uh, in a nutshell. There's a lot more documentation online if you're interested in sort of digging into the details of sort of the algorithm and sort of caveats associated. So then Mitchell touched a little bit on the SSH backend as well. Uh, this has been an interesting backend for us as it's sort of grown over time and supported different, different approaches, different implementations. But the, the sort of core of it has always been the same, which is how do you disintermediate access to the machines and do it in a way where you have control over which developers can SSH into what? How do you have an audit trail of it if someone leaves the company? Did they have the pen that everyone can use to SSH into everything? And get away from those kinds of sort of problems. And so there's been a few different approaches. One is sort of dynamic RSA keys, where anytime you want to SSH into a machine, you talk to Vault first, and it generates a new SSH key for you talks to the machine and installs it as an authorized key uh, in a time-bounded way. So the key is one-time use. You log in with it and Vault evaporates that key later. Uh, the challenge is generating RSA keys tends to like chew up a lot of CPU time. So we moved to this 
more one-time password-based mechanism where you talk to Vault, it generates a UUID, hands it back to you, and says SSH in with this UUID. And then the target machine will uh, make a callback back to Vault to say, is this username and password valid, yes or no? And the latest sort of iteration on this is the certificate authority approach. And what this does is actually leverage sort of a public key infrastructure to avoid having to make a callback to Vault. So in this model, Vault acts as sort of a certificate authority. So it has both you know, a well-known public key that's installed on all the client machines, as well as a secret private key that it holds onto. And now as a developer, when I want to log into a machine, I, you know, I create my Armon SSH key, and I go and talk to Vault and say, I want to go talk to Web Machine 42. Please sign this key for me. And so if I have the right level of access and Vault says I, sh I should be deemed allowed to do such a thing, uh, it will use its private key to sign my key in a very time-bounded way. So say this key is signed for the next minute uh, by Vault uh, to be able to go talk to this machine. Then I just take my signed key, which is you know, it's signed by Vault, but it's my key. It uniquely identifies me. And I send that over to the target machine, and I use that to SSH in. And I sort of drew this dotted line, because we're not actually communicating back to Vault. We're making use of sort of a public key approach to say, like, was this signed by Vault? And I trust Vault. Uh, great, you're allowed to SSH in. So there's not a whole lot of network load that you have to deal with, not a lot of sort of custom configuration. Uh, and you get that nice, you know, you don't have to install the developer's key. You're not sharing a PEM key. You have an audit trail of who's done what. And it, it's a very scalable approach. And so what's nice is, like I said, you really only communicate to Vault pre-flight. Once you're actually talking to Vault, it's normal SSH, minimal computation. doesn't have sort of the cost associated of dynamic RSA. There's no operating specific integration that which one-time password suffered from. And it's a very simple and secure mechanism. The other neat one that's been in the works for a very, very long time, and if you find him, Brian is here from the Vault team. And uh, thank him for his hard work on this one is the combined database backend. Uh, so previously, you know, for a while now, we've supported you know, MySQL, MSQL, Cassandra, Mongo, so on and so forth as different uh, databases that we support dynamic generation from. Each of them sort of managed the life cycle in a slightly different way. Each of them sort of modeled it a little bit differently. So it tended to be a little bit painful uh, when you had a, giant, a sprawl of the number of databases. It was fine if you only had one or two. But the new combined backend makes this really easy. It makes a clear definition of you have database connections and you have database roles. And these are managed in a very uniform way, no matter what type of backend system you're using. So what it looks like now is you first configure basically Vault's connection to the database. This is the privileged connection that it uses that it's not sharing with external users. So here, maybe I'm just giving it my root root username and password to MySQL. And then you define many roles. So I might define my read-only role, my administrator role, my production role, so on and so forth. And these have various levels of access right, that are tied into how MySQL thinks about it. So here I might be using you know, grant select only in my read-only role versus grant update for my administrator role, and so on and so forth. And these are ultimately uh, what's used to generate end user facing credentials. So Vault, again, going back to that previous diagram, is going to connect with its sort of parent highly privileged connection and then generate these dynamic sub-credentials and provide it back to the user, maybe restricted to read-only or administrative. The TOTP backend is pretty neat. Uh, it allows us to sort of both offload the management of TOTP tokens as well as as an organization for you know, many of us probably have TOTP where we authenticate into our upstream. So how do we manage those things, uh, whether it's AWS credentials or, or internal systems that use TOTP? And doing that with sort of uh, vaults, auditing, and authorization language. So again, solves sort of a number of these different problems on both sides of it. And is really, really brain dead easy to use. Uh, and th this is literally all four commands. Uh, to mount the backend to enable the functionality, here I'm just generating a, a test key with sort of vaults default parameters in terms of time and rotation. And it will spit back both sort of a barcode. So you can actually render that as like, a, like an image, like a QR code that you put just literally embed on a website if you want, as well as a URL for things like the Google, uh, Google Authenticator app. And then I can come around and basically just do a read against it anytime I need that code. Um, so I can just make use of a you know, command line command and say, great, I need the code right now. Do a read. Here you can see I sleep 30 seconds, and I'm getting a different code each time. So it makes it really easy. Don't really have to think about the details of it, the algorithms that are used. It's sort of invisible to me. And then ACL parameter restriction is uh, you know, one of many new sort of ACL features that have come out. This goes back to that sort of principle of least privilege, which is maybe I give you access to, to something like the secret foo key or access to the TOTP key, but can I go even further in restricting what you can do with it, right? And so now I can actually give sort of partial access to resources as well. 
um, and restrict the actual parameters of the call I'm able to make. So maybe I can say you're only allowed to make a TOTP key that's valid for 30 seconds. Like you can't change that and make a 60 second TOTP key. And there's two ways of doing it. One is sort of restricting what, what's allowed to a whitelist. One is sort of just banning things in a blacklist. And so an example of what this might look like within the sort of key management context is something like this, right? So maybe I allow you to create new encryption keys, but I'm going to say you're only allowed to create AES type keys, right? So the default type is AES 256. I'm going to say that's the only thing you're allowed to do, right? If you try and change that, Vault's just going to give you a permission to nine error. And I'm going to explicitly prevent you from generating a key that you can export from the system. So the default of the system is non-exportable, but maybe you're trying to do something weird as a user. I'm just going to prevent that in the ACL language entirely. You're just not allowed to create a key that can be exported ever. And so as an operator, I have this very tight grain, fine control over what's allowed in the system. Then looking at some of the things people have been doing with the transit backend, as you get into sort of high volume encrypt, decrypt, uh, people have been asking for the ability to do this in batches as opposed to doing a round trip per key. Uh, and so now we've sort of extended a bunch of these APIs to let you do a batch input, batch output type thing. So here you might just be providing a batch set of, of ciphertext that you want decrypted. Uh, whoops. Uh, and it'll just return the batch set of plain text for you. So making it easier if you're managing sort of sets of encrypted objects together. The other big one is you know, in the privileged bracketing space, Vault supports generating you know, use count restricted tokens. So I might give you access to the system and say, you're only allowed to make you know, n equals three operations. And every time you do something against Vault, it decrements it until it gets to zero, and then your token evaporates. Uh, auditing that used to be a little tricky in terms of just the accounting of how many tokens, how many uses you basically had left. You had to sort of figure out when this thing was created, how many was there, how many operations have taken place, and sort of do a stateful accounting. Uh, and now Vault just does that for you. So within the audit log, it makes it super obvious just like how many uses remain of this thing, so you don't have to do sort of a stateful accounting of it. And there's a bunch more stuff. I just didn't have time to cover it. Uh, there's a whole new IS, uh, I'm sorry, AWS IAM backend, so you can authenticate uh, things like Lambda functions against it and do you know, secret management for like what secrets can this Lambda function get access to. Uh, unified login with Okta and Radius. Uh, etcd version 3 is now supported. MS SQL has come in. There's a bunch of other stuff. Um, so feel free to find me or other people on the Vault team if you have any questions. Um, thank you guys so much. I'm going to hand it uh, back over to Jack. <laughs> <laughs>